But the thing about this is, it's not, it's not the size of the force, but two other things especially, three other things especially. First of all, God is behind him. That's the most important thing. Then there's this. Forgive the Minecraft uh, 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 um, armor. So I don't even know if you can see it very well, but that's a, in your, when your grandkids are playing Minecraft, that's what they're doing. They're, they're building tunnels with people with armor inside of them. It's kind of fun. Uzziah supplied the whole army with shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and stones for slingshots. So what there is new <laughs> to the army? What did we have just a generation earlier when the kings fitted out their army? Shield and spear and that's it, right? These guys get armor. Do you know, everybody here know what mail is? Mail armor? It's rings. And it takes, it's delicate work, actually. This is not something you do on an anvil with a big old 30-pound hammer with a, with a huge forge next to you and a bunch of horseshoes. Rings is a, 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 a small uh, metal uh, bar, you know, like a, like, a, like a heavy, heavy wire, which you then bend with your hammer into a circle and then you connect it to another circle and to another and to another and to another. Um, if you really want to get the feel for, for how complicated it was, take a couple of twist ties at home and pull off the tabs of a pop or a beer can and try to interlace them with just, just with something as simple as a twist tie. And after you get about four done, you're like, I'm, I, I am not going to do any more of this. In Jerusalem, he made war machines produced by clever inventors to be mounted on the towers and at the corners to shoot arrows and large, hurl large stones. His reputation spread far and wide because he received marvelous help until he was strong. This is a trebuchet um, in medieval times in a, in a, in a tower. Uh, this is also what the thing looks like. I was privileged to, be call, to, be, to become part of the New Alm Trebuchet Society, or NUTS, N-U-T-S. Um, they included me because when they were telling me about it, I actually knew not only what a trebuchet is, but I knew the name of one of the historical trebuchets from the, from the medieval period, um, which was my favorite name for a weapon, was Bad Neighbor. <laughs> is a wonderful name for a for a catapult <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm going to go back a slide just to horrify you um, um, can you see uh, let me do it this way is that the slide can you see what they're going to fling a headless person they've already thrown his head and now they're going to give him the rest of him so you get, this, you get this kind of famous uh, saying, release the prisoners. Sometimes this is what they did. So, it's, uh, so I made the screen do this quickly so you wouldn't, I wouldn't draw attention to it. But of course, now I drew attention to it. But, uh, but yeah. But this is Uzziah in the 600s, or, or rather, I'm sorry, the 800s BC. So what did, we get, what did they get called in the text? Clever inventors. Wow. So in addition to uh, uh, better armor and better weapons, they, they're now fortified with what we would call artillery. Um, so besides God being on their side, they have better equipment and they have you know, supply. And also, one more thing, they begin to have victories. And therefore, within the army, you have a buildup of their morale. And wow, with all of those, this, this, even though it's half the size of some earlier armies, they're going to do some amazing things because they've got it all. God is behind them, number one. That, then that was enough. But they also have better equipment for the men, artillery supporting the men. So it's not just about hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore. They're shooting arrows from huge bastion-mounted uh, uh, wall fortifications, not just a, a guy with a longbow, but this is a big mechanical thing with a crank that can shoot arrows, I don't know, maybe three, four, five times as far as a regular shooter could do. Um, 
and, uh, and so forth. And they loved to dip their arrows in oil and light them on fire. Which is why there's a line in one of the prophets, I'm forgetting which one it is, where he talks about soaking their shields. You, your, your shield is covered, covered in leather. See, before you go into battle, you soak it in the water. Because they're going to be shooting fl- flaming arrows at you, so you, you, know, you, uh, you get your shield wet first. All right, Uzziah's sinful pride and death. When he had grown powerful, remember he was trained in some stuff by this spiritual man, Zechariah, earlier, otherwise unknown Zechariah. When he had grown powerful, the pride in his heart led to his destruction. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. Seems like this is about 10 years before his death. He, um, he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest went in after him. He was followed by 80 priests of the Lord, brave men. Why does the chronicler bother to call them brave men? Well, what happened the last time somebody went in and burned unauthorized fire to the Lord? It was the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those first sons of Aaron who were consecrating the first priests of Israel. They offered unauthorized fire to the Lord in some way. Did the king think I get to go into the Holy of Holies? I want to go see the Ark of the Covenant. I know what it is. I've been trained. Well, not trained well enough if you think you can go in to see the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so, And that's why these 80 priests, I like it how they're called brave men. Because how did Nadab and Abihu die? Fire came down from the Lord and consumed them. So these 80 guys, they rush in there knowing full well that, that fire might have come down from the Lord right and erupted in the, in the holy place, killing them all. But they go in to, and how do you get 80 guys in the holy place anyway? It must have been, I mean, they, they rush in. So I don't know if they all get in there, but they, but they go in and they bring them out. They confronted King Uzziah and said to him, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary because you have been unfaithful. This action will not result in any praise for you from the Lord God. That's uh, Rembrandt uh, with a painting of Uzziah. It's, It's not easy to see, but Rembrandt's intention here is that he would be showing Uzziah with leprosy on his face. It looks to most of us like he's just kind of elderly here, right? There is a form of leprosy common in Rembrandt's time where there would just be like extra wrinkles would appear on a man. And I think that's where Rembrandt is getting this from. He's just showing that he became what he thought of as being, when we think of leprosy, we think of either dark spots or white spots and missing digits and things like that. Rembrandt living in a different time with a specific kind of leprosy of his of his period, the, the Luther period, the, the 15th century and 16th century, this was what it looked like. So hard to detect. Uzziah became angry. He had a censer for burning incense in his hand. When he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests beside the altar of incense in the house of the Lord. This shows you how far in he got. Where was the altar of incense? Remember the story of Zechariah in the New Testament? It was all the way back at the back of the holy place next to the curtain on the way in. If he would have gone past that, he would have been in to the most holy place by the ark. So he got that far in, all, uh, what is it, 60 feet into the, into the holy place. When Azariah, the head priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they immediately realized he had leprosy on his forehead. They rushed him out of there. He himself also was in a hurry to leave because the Lord had struck him. He knew. He knew from that moment. King Uzziah remained a leper until the day of his death. This is an actual leper house. Um, this one is in Central Africa. Um, I use this picture because all of the pictures of leper houses in the American South, there's one in, 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 in New York, that's kind of famous and so forth. And there's a, a whole colony 
in, is it Molokai in Hawaii, where there's a whole shore of one island where there's it's a famous old leper colony? None of them look this nice. So this, this African leper house looks about better than anything else I could find. He lived in quarantine because he was a leper. He was excluded from the house of the Lord. Jotham, his son, was in charge of the palace of the king and administered justice for the people of the land. So his son Jotham now rules in his place while dad's out back um, at some leper house. I'm not sure where it would have been. Um, within Jerusalem? I think not. Outside of the city, where do you go? Um, if you get too far south, you're getting to Bethlehem. If you get too far, I mean, really close by to the, to the, to the right, to the east, would have been Bethany, Bethphage. Northeast, close by Jerusalem, is the village of Nob. Remember David finding uh, Goliath's sword and so forth and eating the, 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 the bread at Nob and so forth? I, so I'm kind of left with maybe northwest or west of the city. There may have been an area that was sparsely populated and that they were able to set up a house, a leper house, and kind of put a fence around it or a wall or something. This is for the, but it had to be close by to be guarded. And he is the king, so, you know, exactly where? Gehenna, right below the southern wall of the, of the old city, of the city of David. Well, yeah, but it's only inches away and not and not uh, to five miles away. So, um, uh, uh, the 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 nice people who live right across the street from the church over here, on uh, that's that's Gehenna, if the church is the is the temple, okay, it's right there. And why why was it always burning? No, because they dumped all their garbage there. Sure, except that probably the wind was blowing the right way that usually it didn't. Yeah. Also, what's the overriding smell from the temple? Two things. Incense and the burning sacrifices. So a lot of incense kind of covers over a, a, lot, of, a lot of smells. Um, when I moved the cat litter box into the upstairs bathroom, I began buying, um, what are they called? The air fresheners. Um, no air fresheners, the, 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 the actual standalone things. And they cover over a lot of, a lot of, a lot of odors. So. The rest of the Acts of Uzziah from first to last were recorded by Isaiah, son of Amoz, the prophet. So uh, there's a whole lot of stuff in Isaiah that goes back to um, King Hezekiah. Well, he's not alive yet. So um, uh, this record of Isaiah maybe talking about a book that's not the prophet Isaiah, but some kind of historical record by Isaiah that we just don't have. Or it also could be, and, and I'm, I'm kind of on this boat, but you don't have to be along with me, because three or four chapters of, 36, 37, 38, 39, four chapters of Isaiah are duplicated in 2 Kings. Could this be Kings? Did Isaiah write kings? Possible. Um, or wrote a lot of kings and it got finished off by somebody else like Jeremiah. It's possible. So uh, uh, that's, that's kind of an old thought about, about, about these books. So I'm not exactly sure. Uzziah rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings because they said he is a leper. His son Jotham ruled as a king in his place. So he's buried because he's a leper. So he's not buried with the kings. He's buried with his fathers. So what does that mean exactly? Did Uzziah get buried in kind of a family grave near Jerusalem, but not in the valley of the king? By the way, the, 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 the cemetery of the kings, the tombs of the kings, is inside the city walls. David is buried in the city of David. So probably under Bob's house in the city, I don't know where, but somewhere under there down in a cave is David's actual tomb. Um, but uh, uh, probably Bob, Ben Bob, you know, whoever this is. Um, but uh, Uzziah is outside somewhere, so he gets a, a tomb somewhere else because he was a leper. Jotham, his, his son. 
Jotham, 25 years old when he became king, ruled in Jerusalem for 16 years. His mother named, oh, I'm not, I, don't have, I don't have the slide up for you. Let me start over again. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. So that was Uzziah, one of Uzziah's wives, or the only wife of Uzziah we know of, was Jerusha. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord in everything, as his father Uzziah had done, but he did not go into the temple of the Lord as Uzziah had done. The people, however, still followed corrupt practices. So the king himself is a good king. People are starting, starting to spin off into some corruption. Again, though, no reference actually to the high places. So um, were the high places still removed? Um, but the people are following corrupt practices. The king has no control over what Barbie or G.I. Joe you have in a niche in your kitchen to pray to. You know, why do I say Barbie and G.I. Joe? Because that's the size of the household gods. You know, standard G.I. Joe was 12 inches back in the old days. And I believe a Barbie was 10 or 11 inches. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. He also carried out extensive construction work on the wall of Ophel. He also built cities in the hill country of Judah. On the wooded hills, he built forts and towers. Okay, there's a valley, or there was, in between the city of, the old city of David and the Temple Mount, and it went pretty deep. They had to fill it in, and they called that fill the Millo. Okay, the hill of Ophel is not identical to the Millo. It's this stepped structure, I think, that we see here. So this is what Jotham adds, is this easier way to get up the hill to the, to the temple for the people. It was a lot of steps. Um, and he worked on, we're told, the upper gate above the steps. And now you've got Solomon's south wall. You see a lot of steps going down from the gate to the upper gate and, and then below the south wall gate as well um, and uh, so forth. Uh, anybody who goes to Jerusalem today will see reconstructions that include a much higher south wall that Herod built. But you can still kind of see that stepped area that Jotham is responsible for behind all of that. The thing that this picture is missing, this is Herod's time, this is maybe Solomon or Jotham's time, is the thing that we're missing here is where was Solomon's house? Because it seems to have been connected to the temple court. So I think to the left of that step structure, we probably would have expected to have seen a mansion, a big, beautiful stone building would have been the king's palace. Um, so I think that's missing here. Do you see the low structures with, with kind of big doors to the left and right of the stepped area? I think those are trying to represent Solomon's uh, stables. He's, he, he had lots and lots of horses. We read about that earlier. And many, many, and the area that was thought to be his stables, you know, in ancient times, there's this underground area that they thought were the stables. I think not. That was either a huge cistern for the drinking water for the city, or it was simply the support structure. It's all arches to keep the city from collapsing. Because you have to go from the bottom of the city to where the bedrock is, and it's about two stories in some areas. So you need. Some kind, and, and just putting gravel in there, like, they, like, they, like is below my house, is not going to cut it for a huge, gigantic stone temple and palace area. You know, for my little um, uh, 1968 Rambler, which is what my house is, I know it sounds like a car, but it's my home, um, that's enough, those gravel that's, that's out back there. But I, I can hardly put in a bird uh, feeder post in my yard because... The gravel is that high. You know, they're, 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 the topsoil is not very deep in my yard. It's all gravel back there in that part of town. So I think that, I think once upon a time in New Ulm, there was a valley there. And they filled it all in with gravel at some point and when they began building the modern houses. He waged war against the king of the Ammonites and defeated them. That year, the Ammonites gave him a hundred talents of silver. Remember we had that number before? How many is a hundred talents? 
four tons. Remember the elephant? That's, that's 100 talents. Um, so 60,000 bushels of wheat, that's a lot of wheat, and 60,000 bushels of barley, a lot of barley too. What's the, what's the difference between wheat and barley as far as what you do with it? Which is good bread and which is kind of second-rate bread? Wheat is the good bread, bar- barley is the second-class bread, but what else do you do with barley? John Barleycorn makes beer, right? Yeah. Right? So, but in, how, it, in how, you, how you do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and by the way, they had beer. Um, it's one of the three alcoholic beverages of ancient times. They couldn't distill anything yet, so nothing like whiskey is, is there in ancient times. What are, the, what are the three alcohols they had in, the Bible, in biblical times? Wine. Beer, wine. Yeah. Um, it's not mentioned in the Bible, the third one, but it was there in biblical times. Mead. Make mead out of honey. Um, that was, that was this, that was, however, there are references to honey in the priests where you know that they knew about mead because the priests weren't supposed to have honey. Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, not a priest, but a um, um, uh, uh, Nazarite. So avoid alcohol. He had to avoid mead or honey as well. Um, although, what do you got Samson doing? Eating honey out of the carcass of a lion and stuff like that. Well, Samson's a different... He's the exception that proves all the rules about Nazarites. The Ammonites paid him this amount in the second and third years. So three years of this much silver is a lot of money this young king made from this war. Jotham became powerful because he aligned his ways with the ways of the Lord his God. What God says, that's what I'm going to do. You can find the rest of the acts of Jotham in all his wars and his ways, written in the books of the kings of Israel and Judah. And this is, a, this is a place where possibly the book of the kings of Israel and Judah could be a reference to the book of kings. It might not be. It could be some other chronicle that they had, but it could actually be kings. We just mentioned that with Isaiah a little while ago. Also, uh, I, the, uh, the uh, EHV has done something here with their translation and has Americanized um, what we often get is a passive. Because often in, the, in the, the, the oriental way of talking is, and there, as for the rest of the Acts of Jotham, are they not found, written? You know, that, that's kind of how the language goes. But that's not how we talk. And so the EHV has simply said, you can find the rest of the Acts of Jotham and his wars written in the book of the Kings. It doesn't change the meaning of the text at all, but it puts it into our vernacular. As Luther often complained, it's hard to get Moses to speak German. And uh, so here we're getting Isaiah or whomever to speak, you know, really Minnesotan um, English. Another thing about the EHV is that almost all the translators are from either Wisconsin or Minnesota. So you've got kind of a Scandinavian thing going on and a German thing still going on with the Wartburg Project. He was 25 years old when he became king and he ruled in Jerusalem for 16 years. Jotham rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. There is even an example of the king being buried in the city limits in these tombs of the kings. His son Ahaz ruled as king in his place. Um, what, I want to ask a couple of questions in our last couple of minutes. What had God accomplished through Uzziah and Jotham? What are some of the achievements of these kings. So cities got built. Yeah, way out on the coastline and then closer in the hills. Um, um, that's a, a difference I see in the two men. Is that with, uh, with, with Uzziah, it's kind of far flung. You know, way down by, you know, down by Baezi and Geber, I'm going to build Elat and take over Philistia. And Jotham, his son, is more like, you know, right you know, we could use a tower right there. So let's build a tower right there because I'm not going to be worried so much about Mankato as I am about Cortland. That's the difference between the vision of the kings. I want this in close here. Um, uh, and uh, did they leave Israel politically stronger? Yeah, yeah. What, what American presidents have left the country visibly politically stronger after their time as president. Jackson, Andy Jackson, Eisenhower, 
Sure. Reagan. I was thinking George Washington, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, too, and uh, so forth. And also, when, when was the country at its political low point? I think the beginning of the Civil War. Therefore, I believe Lincoln, hard, fast, did what it took, did everything it took, worked, you know, these 18-hour days, his whole presidency, even after the death of his son, and, you know, kept it up, and the, and the insanity of his wife and all of these things um, worked and worked and worked and worked. So did they leave Israel spiritually stronger? In a, in a manner of speaking, yes. Um, for one thing, you see this in the improvements on what especially, from a king's standpoint, on the temple, I believe. Well, the, 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 the army is, on the, is, is politically stronger. But the, but the improvements on the temple show their focus on the temple. Why do, we have to, why, why do we have to build four more gates? Well, people are getting up there. Let's make it easier for the people to get in there, do their worshiping. I want the king to be able to get in there, do the worshiping and so forth. And, uh, and that's what those improvements on the temple really show is the focus. You know, the king can only do so much. And Uzziah showed us how he can blow it. He almost died from that. But his son comes back and continues the improvements, not only with, uh, with, uh, with, with the walls and the gates, but that stepped area going up, to the, going up to the temple as well. So things are moving in the right direction for God's people. But at just this time, the prophets show up because things are not going well in the north especially. And the writing prophets of this time period, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, those are the three main ones from this time period. Um, Jonah is, is coming up here too pretty soon, um, are going to focus on what's wrong in the north because the end is coming soon for the north. The Assyrians are on their way. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Orleans, Minnesota.